When I was little, I always had this feeling inside my heart that I couldn't explain. I would always tell my parents that my heart hurt. And obviously they would be worried, they would take me to the doctor only to find out that my heart was perfectly fine. It wasn't until years later that I understood what this feeling was. It was fear, anxiety. Today I wanted to share with you guys something incredibly personal and that is my mental health journey. I have shared glimpses here and there in the past, in my videos, on my social media, in my blog posts, but I've never really talked about it in the full picture how I think it started, how it accumulated, and how it grew so intense and ruined relationships, and of course how it has shaped me as a person today. And hopefully by sharing my story and my journey, it might help someone out there who is struggling with the same things that I struggled with. So back to fear, back to anxiety. I could never really explain this feeling as a child. It just felt like that there was something missing like I was floating on clouds and I was about to fall through and there was nothing to anchor my soul down to the earth. It just kind of felt like there was something missing. And I, of course, come from an Asian family. And I think for those of you who come from a similar cultural background, you would know that corporal punishment is not a rare thing. And you would also rarely express your love and appreciation for your family verbally or physically. So I think the absence of that, along with the corporal punishment, definitely shaped my mental health in some way. Along with that, I was also one of the few Asians in my primary school. Everyone in my class was predominantly white. And I remember trying to make friends with this girl and she would reject me saying that she didn't want to be my friend because I was Asian. And maybe from there, that's when the self-loathe started. I started hating the fact that I am Asian and there wasn't any Asian representation in the media. All the TV shows I watched, all the actors and actresses were white. So I think all of this just kind of festered a sense of self-loathe within me and the idea that I'm not good enough. It was in high school when I first started self-harming. I don't really remember what the catalyst was for that. It was during the early 2000s when the emo phase was really popular and there were bands like My Chemical Romance, Fall Out Boy, Mayday Parade, they were really big. So maybe that influenced my behaviors and actions a little bit. But I just found that self-harming really helped to soothe and distract me from the hurt and pain that I was feeling inside my heart. And it was also for me a physical way to show the invisible pain that I was going through. It made it more tangible. It made it feel almost like it was more valid. Like here, here is the proof that I am hurting emotionally. And when my friends found out, I quotation mark friends because in retrospect, they were not friends. But when my friends found out that I was self-harming, they would call me an attention seeker and that I was just doing it for attention. Another pivotal moment in my life was when I was about 12, 13 years old. I was in love with the Princess Diaries book series by Meg Cabot. I think it was the third book when the main character, Mia Thermopolis, finally got together with her love interest, Michael Moskowitz. And I remember just how emotional I was when that happened, when they finally got together. I was crying, I was bawling. And I, and I thought like, that's it. That's the solution to all my problems and to fix or feel this emptiness inside me. I needed to find what Mia had found. I needed to find my own Michael Moskowitz. I needed to find a boyfriend. And I was 14 years old when I got my first boyfriend and he was three years older than me. He had floppy hair that covered his face and made him super mysterious. He played the guitar and he went to another school. So it was like, cool, I have a really cool boyfriend. During that time when we were together, I would also get anonymous emails from someone who would write things to me about how I'm an attention seeker, 
that no one really likes me, that I manipulated my boyfriend into liking me and that I didn't deserve him. And can you imagine as like a 14, 15, 16 year old when you're still kind of trying to figure out who you are in life, getting emails like that from someone anonymous almost on a daily basis. Yeah, I it really did affect me and it did shape how I saw myself. Like, oh, maybe I am not good enough. Maybe I am this and I am that. Because of this, I would also start feeling extremely jealous of other girls that were in my boyfriend's life. When he went to college, I would get very suspicious of the girls that he hung out with. I would also get suspicious whenever he hung out with his sister. I would get fearful that he was spending so much time with other people that he would realize that like I'm not good enough and that he was going to eventually leave. And this fear and suspicion in my mind would get so intense that I would try and do things that I thought would make the situation better, but actually made the situations worse. There were a lot of like dramatic situations which I kind of made happen. And because of that, I was like, maybe I am manipulative. Maybe I am an attention seeker. Maybe I'm doing this because I like the drama and the attention. But obviously at that time, I didn't know about like mental health stuff. I just thought like this is just who I am as a person. I guess it's also really important to note that during my final year of high school, my dad also went through a mental health crisis and he was admitted to the hospital. And I guess what's important to know is like mental health issues are and can be genetic. Um, but at that time, I tried to distance myself from that situation. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. It was my final year of high school and I really wanted to do well so that I could leave that hellhole and go to a really good university and prove everyone wrong. So yeah, I distanced myself from the situation with my dad. You know, that's probably not a good thing to do when you have a family member going through something like that. But yeah, I just remember that I tried to stay away and I spent a lot of time with my boyfriend. I think there wasn't like a day that I had gone without seeing him. It was almost like I had developed like this codependence on him. But anyways, that relationship eventually ended. We were together for five years. That ended after high school. And ironically, I was the one that left because I had wandering eyes. But even after we broke up, I still felt very lost and very empty inside. I had a few flings here and there, which never ended great. There was one fling who, after we kind of ended things, he told myself that I should have done the world a favor and cut a little deeper. Uh, and so that really hurt because you know, obviously I am a type of person that will wear my heart on my sleeve and I can be extremely vulnerable to people. Having done that and then having gotten that response was like a real shock for me. Like maybe what he's saying is right. Maybe I am just a burden in this world to a lot of people. And then not so long after that, I had my very, 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 very public long distance relationship. Uh, um, I'd like to say that that was when my life got better, but I think there was a lot of underlying mental health issues that I had not resolved, let alone addressed. And just like my first relationship, I depended too much on somebody else to try and feel that sense of emptiness within me. Yeah, I was very dependent on that relationship. And then I spent a year in Europe in 2014 as part of my university degree. And I always tell everyone that 2014 was the best year of my life and it was, but what a lot of people don't know is that I had a lot of very dark moments. I think that was when a lot of my internalized self-loathing just manifested so much that it really just gave way to like bursts of really dark moments, especially when it came to visiting my ex's friends and family in Sweden. That feeling of inferiority was so strong. It came back and it was like, 
bam. It was like I was looking at a normal family and feeling like I didn't belong. Like I was trying so hard to try and fit in that it would make me really shy and anxious and withdrawn. And I felt like, you know, this situation and me being in this relationship with him was too good to be true. That there was so many other prettier girls, Swedish girls that are better than me. Why, why would he choose me? It was basically the same kind of feelings that I had in my first relationship, but like a hundred times more amplified. And I would do things that would sabotage the relationship with this idea that by doing so, it would make him stay with me more. But in reality, it was kind of like pushing him away. 2014 was also the year that I started self-harming more frequently as a coping mechanism. So when I got back from my year abroad, back to Australia, I decided to see a psychologist because you know, I just had like this amazing year full of crazy emotions, discovering a whole new part of the world. And I felt like back in Australia, I had nothing and I was feeling even more empty. So I went to see the psychologist and I told her everything that I was feeling. And then she told me about this disorder called borderline personality disorder, BPD. When I got home that day, I went online and did my own research about BPD and everything that I was reading, I was just like, wow, this is me. Like I experienced so many symptoms and traits on this list. So there's nine symptoms of BPD. There's fear of abandonment, tick, unstable relationships, tick, shifting self-image, tick, impulsive self-destructive behaviors tick, self-harm, tick, extreme emotional mood swings, tick, chronic feelings of emptiness, tick, 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 explosive anger, feeling suspicious or out of touch with reality, tick, tick, tick. I was ticking all the boxes and reading all the descriptions of each symptom and I felt like I was really reading about myself. And at the same time, there was also a lot of stigma around BPD back in those days and a lot of articles from people who have been with someone with BPD saying that they are literally the devil, that they're so manipulative, that they're so horrible and to stay away from them because they will ruin your life. <laughs> um, so that kind of scared me a little bit like, wow, am I, am I really the devil? Am I really that bad that people say to stay away from me? So I didn't really do much with my diagnosis after that. I kind of just uh, resigned to the fact that I had BPD and that, yeah, that's the reason that I am the way that I am. And I left it at that and I didn't go back to see that psychologist. But because I didn't do anything to address my disorder, my very public relationship got worse, especially after he came to Australia. He found a new job that would find him meeting new people every day, meeting new girls, going traveling all across Australia, overseas, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks. And I would start to feel like, oh my God, I'm, I'm losing him. And I was really unhappy with my life at that point. I had just finished university and I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Whereas he was completely thriving and loving life. And I think there was just an accumulation of triggering events, like when he would go overseas and I wouldn't hear from him for a few days. And those were triggering events that I was not equipped to deal with. So because of those triggering events, I decided to go see another psychologist and I told her about how I have BPD and at first she was reluctant to label me as having BPD, but she made me do cognitive behavior therapy, which aimed to kind of challenge my unhealthy thoughts and assumptions. I also started taking antidepressants, which actually wasn't really helpful for me, to be honest. And I think I documented a bit of this um, in my videos, my vlogs. There was like three monthly vlogs in the lead up to what would be the explosion. So obviously I was really struggling with learning how to regulate my emotions and shit really hit the fan because of that and my relationship broke down. He broke up with me and oh my God, like I did not have the resources or the knowledge or the tools 
to be able to handle it in a healthy way. What it felt like. It felt like I was being abandoned. That's what it felt like. And I felt like what everyone had said about me in the past was true. I felt like those articles that I had read about people with BPD, about how we're the devil and that we just ruin people's lives and to stay away from us. I just felt like, yeah, that's, I guess that's, that's the truth. Like stay away from me. No wonder people can't love me, I guess. So I'm feeling all these intense emotions and I don't know how to properly express the pain and hurt that I feel aside from, you know, ripping out my skin, banging my head against the wall. Apart from like screaming and throwing things, I was in like so much emotional pain that I wanted to die, that I would sit in my car and plan how to die. I would write my suicide notes there. I really just did not want to be alive anymore. And just like talking about it now, it's like, wow, <laughs> it's crazy to think that I am sitting here today. Yeah, I remember I took pills. I took too many antidepressants and I had emergency services called on me and I would have to go to the hospital, to the emergency room. And I would be like, yeah, I took this many pills. And after that, they'd like send me back home. And then I'd be back to this misery of having something so important to me, so vital and integral to my very being just gone, vanish, like I had, I felt like I had nothing. And then because of this very traumatic event, my psychologist had me sign up for dialectical behavior therapy, DBT, which is more aimed towards people who have borderline personality disorder. And through that, I actually met a lot of people who had the same disorder. And there was one girl who was the same age as me and she had also just broken up with her boyfriend. So I felt like I was in a room full of similar people as, as me. And it kind of, it was kind of comforting in a way, like knowing like we're all going through these, this very traumatic event in our life, but we're all here trying to like get through it together. <laughs> it was actually through these DBT classes that I actually started learning more about the disorder, about BPD about the neurology and the psychology behind it, about how people with BPD often have a smaller amygdala, which is the part of the brain that processes and gives meaning to emotions, about how they also have an active prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that regulates emotions. I also started to learn strategies on how to regulate these emotions and the idea that, you know, it is an exercise and that you have to really unlearn all the other unhealthy coping mechanisms that you're so accustomed to because of all these years of doing them about, you know, having to unlearn all these unhealthy thoughts that you've had about yourself for so many years. The idea that you're not good enough. That's something that you've been telling yourself for all these years. So having to unlearn that and train your brain to react differently to triggers. Of course, at that time, I felt like all of this learning came way too late. The traumatic event had already happened and I felt like, what's the point? I've already lost everything. I've already lost my meaning to life. So for the next three years, I really struggled with my mental health. I struggled with thoughts of suicide. I struggled with emotional triggers and I struggled with, you know, that emptiness that I felt inside me. I felt like my life had no meaning and had no purpose. And because of that, I actually quickly jumped into a new relationship after that, which I know is not good. You shouldn't depend on other people to try and fulfill you and to bring you that missing thing in your life. I also started seeing a new psychologist who this time actually specialized in people with borderline personality disorder. She was really good. I really learned a lot from her. I could text her whenever I was in a state of emotional distress and she would guide me through 
strategies to help me de-escalate my emotions. But man, there were like so many sessions where I would be sitting in the chair shaking and crying the entire time because like I was just so overwhelmed with intense emotions like all the time. <sighs> yeah, just thinking about that. Like it's really draining. Like just thinking about it makes me exhausted. <laughs> there was one situation. I think I had the day off work that day and because of that I didn't have anything to distract me from the emptiness, the heaviness, the overwhelming feelings and the thoughts that were going through my mind. And I just started to feel anxious about it. I started to feel panicky um, and I felt like I had nothing to do, no one to talk to. And I remember I went into my bathroom, I turned on the tap for the bathtub, I locked the door and I sat fully clothed in the bathtub and I started to text my psychologist. And I actually still have the text. Like I can't really express now how I felt back then, but maybe the texts will kind of give you a glimpse onto how my mental state was. Hi, I'm not feeling well. Hi Leonie, what are you feeling at the moment? Like, I don't want to be alive. Where are you and what's happening? At home, in my bathroom? I don't know, I can't handle the emotions. Do I need to call someone to take you to the hospital? I really don't want to go to the hospital. Okay, can we try to work with some skills then? Let's see if we can get you to a more safe state. But if we can't, I need you to go to hospital. Your safety is most important. Are you still with me? Yes. Thanks. What thoughts are coming up? That maybe I should just die, but I don't know how to. Well, I'm glad to hear that you don't know how to. I'm sorry to hear you're in so much pain at the moment. Has anything happened this morning to contribute to how you're feeling? I have a day off work and I have just been sleeping because I don't want to be alive. When did you start feeling like you don't want to be alive? When I woke up. What is it that's making you want to die? Having to feel this anxiety and loneliness for the rest of my life. It would definitely be terrifying to feel like it was going to feel this bad forever. And depressed moods make us convinced that this is true. Before we work on checking the facts though, are there any skills that might help reduce the distress at the moment? Because it's so hard to think when you're really distressed. Still there? Are you able to take a call? Leone, can you please respond in some way? Otherwise I have to send an ambulance. Not a threat, I just want you to be safe. I don't see the point. I can understand that and yet there is a part of you that reached out. I want to try and help you work through this with skills to avoid hospital if that's what you want. I just want to be left alone now. Unfortunately, I'm not confident that you can keep yourself safe right now. I need you to talk to me about what's happening so I know you can stay safe. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. I just want to be alone. I'm sorry, but I'm not convinced. I want to respect your needs, but I need more to know that you can keep safe. So can we have a conversation about how to keep safe? I really don't want to. I understand and I don't want to make this more overwhelming for you and I don't know that being alone right now is the most helpful thing. The alternative is that we get an ambulance out to you so that you have others to keep you safe. What do you want me to do? I just want to be left alone. Okay, can you tell me what you are going to do to keep yourself safe? Just sit here in the bathroom until I get too tired to do anything. Okay, for one last time, I'm going to ask, can we please have a conversation by phone about this? I really don't want to, I'm sorry. Okay, I have to call someone to come out to you, but I'm not doing anything wrong. I know, Leonie, but I'm worried about your safety and you're not communicating with me. I'm fine, I'm over it now. I'm sorry, but I have to send someone out. I can't just leave it. 
Leonie, there is a car coming out to your address to do a welfare check. You need to answer the door when they arrive to let them know you are okay. If they don't, they might break in to check on you. They also might call an ambulance. I'm sorry, I know this is not what you wanted, but your safety is my priority and the risk is too high to ignore at the moment. Um, yeah, so you can imagine the surprise when my dad opened up the door to really loud banging by the police and they were telling me to open the bathroom door or they would break it down. So I got out of the bathtub, my clothes were dripping wet and I opened the door. They checked that I was like physically okay and then they told me to get dressed and then they took me to the hospital in the police car and that was the first time that I actually ever rode on the back of a police car. <laughs> when we got to the hospital, I remember sitting with the police officer as I was waiting for the psychologist to come out and see me. And he said all the wrong things that you shouldn't say to someone who is feeling like they want to give up on life. He was like, you have such a good life. You have such a good job, you finish university, why would you do something stupid like kill yourself? And I didn't say anything back to him, but I just remember thinking like, you don't understand, you don't understand the pain that I feel. Like, how can you say something like, I have such a good life when I feel like I don't. But anyway, long story short, I was admitted to the psych ward at the hospital and that was something that I did not really enjoy that much. I couldn't have my phone with me and I could only have visitors during certain times of the day. So I felt actually quite socially isolated. I was like so bored out of my mind, but thankfully like my boyfriend and my friends and my mum would come visit me every day. They would bring things for me to do. I remember when my dad found out that I was admitted to the psych ward his reaction was like, oh my God, you're going to ruin your reputation at work. And I remember thinking like, yeah, that's what's more important, my reputation, not the fact that I don't want to be alive anymore. <laughs> After that event, I continued to see my psychologist. I started taking different antidepressants, which made me feel completely numb. Like I did not feel anything at all. And I hated that. Like, I feel like I would rather feel sad and depressed than to feel nothing. So after a few months, I tried to wean myself off these antidepressants because I didn't like the way they made me feel. It wasn't necessarily making me feel better. It just made me feel nothing. And I remember the withdrawal symptoms from those antidepressants was freaking crazy. I had to take like a week off work because I was experiencing shock waves, electric shock waves through my body. I had the most intense scrutinizing headaches and I felt like, oh my God, I have to keep taking them. Otherwise I'm going to feel this weird sensation through my body forever. But I eventually tapered myself off them. And I understand that for some people, antidepressants can help. But for me, I just felt like it didn't. I don't exactly know when the turning point was when I started to feel more okay and start feeling better. And I don't think necessarily right now that I am 100% better. I think all those symptoms of BPD are still there, but maybe it's because I've developed more of a self-awareness of what my triggers are and my emotions and I've learned some strategies on how to deal with them. But I think last year, 2020, was when things did start to become better for my mental health. I know I started to try and depend less on somebody else to try and fulfill that emptiness inside me. And I also started hanging out with my friends more often. I started signing up for activities that I actually enjoyed, like learning Swedish or going rock climbing. And I was also really enjoying the work I was doing at my job. I felt like I was making a difference in the world. And it just felt like for the first time in a long time, I had something to look forward to in life. I had just put down a deposit for my first apartment, my first home. And yeah, I felt like my life was busy and kind of finally, after all these years, amounting to something. Like for the first time, maybe I am good enough? I also became part of the BTS ARMY last year. I actually think that played a massive part in changing my perspective in life. 
And I know it sounds crazy and stupid, like a Korean boy group, a Korean K-pop group can help someone who's been struggling for so many years with mental health. How can they make someone feel more happier and more hopeful about life? But it's true. I know I said I stopped trying to depend on somebody else to bring me happiness, but maybe I've like transferred that dependence onto BTS or something. But I don't know, whenever I feel down, I just watch their videos or I listen to their songs and I feel like I can get through whatever is happening in my life. I also started seeing my psychologist less last year and I found that I was postponing my appointments a lot more because I had made plans with friends that that clashed with the appointments. And eventually when I did see my psychologist again, she said that I looked better, that my attitude was different, and I wasn't sitting there shaking, crying uncontrollably anymore. And yeah, she said that it seems like I found a way to manage my emotions better. That was my last appointment with her. That was in October last year. I have been seeing her for three years, since 2017, after the traumatic breakup. And now, here I am today, I'm not gonna lie and say that everything is completely fine and that I'm cured, because I'm not. I still have my moments and I still have my emotional triggers and there's still like existential question marks above my head and I still have the urge to self-harm when things go bad and sometimes I do give in to those tingling sensations inside my arm but overall I am content with my life and though there are some times when I feel sadness over things that happened in the past and ashamed of some of the actions that I've taken I feel like those things had to happen in order for me to be the better version of myself. Those experiences shaped who I am today and I don't want to hate myself anymore. I think that's why I feel so strongly opposed to things like cancel culture and why I feel so sorry for people who kind of go down the wrong path. Like, we all make mistakes in our lives, especially when we're younger and our brains aren't fully developed yet. And there are so many shitty influences out there in the world telling you you're not good enough, telling you you're an attention seeker, telling you you're manipulative, telling you this and that. All of these things that shape your actions and how you react to emotional triggers. And when there's no one there to guide you through that and help you through and show you love and appreciation for your existence, of course sometimes you make bad decisions. I don't think we should cancel or judge someone based on that, but rather help them, guide them. Maybe they don't have the right strategies to deal with certain situations in their life. Maybe they do have a smaller amygdala than the rest of us. Maybe they just haven't discovered BTS yet. I don't know, our brains are weird. They're complex and there's still so much to learn about mental health. And I think there's a lot of people who struggle because they don't have access to psychologists or supportive friends or they think that it's shameful to seek help. So hopefully by sharing my experience, my story, my journey so far, it will encourage many others out there, maybe you who are watching, to seek help if you need it, to look after your mental health and to reflect on your past and not put blame on anyone or anything, but to understand how it has shaped you to become the person you are today and take steps to become a better version of yourself. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'm sorry if it was a bit of a mess. Obviously, it's very hard to try and sum up 28 years of a mental health story in a short and succinct way. But thank you if you've lasted this long. And for now, if you are feeling a bit down, um, go listen to Magic Shop by BTS. That song always makes me feel like things will be okay. Uh, thank you, and I will see you in my next video.